Got it. Say hi. Say hi to oh, the people. Hi. <laughs> hi to the people. There's like two of us. Three of us here. <laughs> Only one of us here. Exactly. But you know, this is a Where public we, meeting, so it's published and distributed. So. For future All generations. Right. That's probably that's probably why there's only three of us here now because uh, everybody's realised that it's getting published out oh, there. Oh yeah, I did put that thing in there. Did you see it? After the last movie? week's, yeah. You see it? I made a little clip. Did you see it? That's perfect. Where two or more are gathered, there I am in the midst of them. There you go. Thank you, Father. I'm here to make myself redundant. And those who um, those who want this will be here, and those who don't, you know. Which brings me to um, one of the posts I made this morning, which is the understanding of the value of the goal. You know, it's like the value of the goal, the goal of the course is inner peace, but the total um, capacity for what inner peace is capable of bringing the mind to as a, as a recognition, a self-recognition is beyond uh, words, beyond speaking about but the understanding and the appreciation of having a goal that literally liberates you from recycling in the third dimension is something that maybe two in 10,000 people will want to hear about. So, which I think is uh, biblically accurate for the first time in a long time I've quoted something correctly. But, uh, two in 10,000 will hear this. <laughs> so congratulations on being the two in 10,000. Collect your prize at the door. <laughs> anyway, giving the giving the goal a value, unfortunately, seems to be something that's often based in suffering. Like how much suffering need I go through before I begin to value that there might be a better way? You know, the reluctance to want to relinquish uh, dependence on my own ability to solve my problems is, um, man, it's tenacious. You know, I've seen it in myself, not, not so much lately, but in the early stages when I was doing the workbook lessons and stuff, it was just like, oh man, there I go again, thinking I know something about something, thinking that my healing can proceed along lines that make sense to me rather than lines that are purely miraculous. You know, those sort of things. And you can get caught up with stuff because there's so much spiritual gobbledygook around, including, of course, in miracles. I mean, I put the whole lot in that basket, spiritual gobbledygook, because to the mind that doesn't know what it is and that it's attempting to work it out using the application of principles, um, it is gobbledygook. It doesn't make sense. You know, it's like in, in that mind is constantly struggling for some way to reference it and framework it so that it does make some kind of sense. You know, and it's not until finally you let go and just go, I have no clue, but I'm in this. You know, How it is you can hear that there is no world and not consider that you're actually in for the penny, in for the pound, I don't know. But uh, you know, I remember Ted did a, a funny little session one day and there used to be on average when that center was running at like full capacity. And I don't really know what full capacity means, but in its heyday, um, there was probably about anywhere from 50 to 110 people in the room, like on any given day of the week, if it was pouring with rain, there'd be less. And, you know, and there was a, all the fringe dwellers. And then there was the guys with, that were always there every day. And, uh, the front door was always open, like it fronted onto the street. People could just walk in and out. There was no one you had to see, no, no whatever. You could just walk in and participate. And uh, Ted used to make a joke about being the door being open. So it wasn't so much to let people in, but it was to let people run out, <laughs> to let them get out of there because it was a place of total confrontation, you know, and you're always making that confrontation with the value that you've given the goal. You can't make it the confrontation with the goal itself because you don't know what that is. It's going to take a leap of faith. You can theorize what it is and you can study about what the goal is and all of that sort of stuff, but you're only ever actually making a confrontation with your own thoughts about it. My thoughts about love tell me that this is what love is, 
but unconditional love well what is that i can't find a reference for it in my mind so i'll just continue to use my thoughts about what i think unconditional love is until i'm exposed as being false about that and then i'll either change or i'll run away you know so that's the that's the process that's why you leave the door open and ted used to say guys are going to hear this and because they hear it they're going to run away and then give it six months, they'll be back. And then I'll hear it again. I'll run away a bit more. <laughs> Sometimes you just have to run away a few times until you can see your pattern. Oh, I'm running from, I'm running from taking total responsibility for my falsity in the belief that I think love is limited. You know, the last thing I want to do is love myself unconditionally. The last thing, because that ends the dream. That ends the dream of separation. And I don't really want the dream of separation to end. I just want a better version of it. You know? So there's all this, um, you know, you see all these memes and things, be the best you that you can be. And, uh, you know, I'm in, a, I'm in a period of growth and all of this stuff. There's no such thing as a period of growth. There's a period of ungrowth. There's a period of unlearning. And in a sense, um, you don't grow by unlearning. You reveal what is already there you reveal the truth that you already are there's not something that you um process through a particular path of spiritual discipline in order to gain you've already got it it's already what you are you are perfect you are whole because god created you that way so there's just the recognition of it but how deep down the rabbit hole do you want to go how much of that recognition are you willing to take on board now in this moment and i'm whole and perfect what about all these other thoughts that tell me i'm guilty and useless and uh, everything else what about them what about those thoughts you can only what about them based on other ideas that reference them which are in association with them in your own thinking if your own thinking doesn't mean anything then what the hell's going on what are you doing you know? It's a funny thing. It's like, well, what am I doing in my own mind? What am I doing in my own thinking? It's just a circle, a big circle. And every time it comes around, that part of my mind that doesn't quite give full value to the goal paints it a different color as if it's actually a different whole process going on, but it's actually the same track, the same train, just with different graffiti on it. And because the graffiti looks different and the scenery looks different, I think it's actually a different thing. Mm -hmm. All of these um, ideas, you know, and it's like I look at a lot of those things. People always send me stuff. I don't know how the, if there's a button on Facebook where you can just push people for people not to send you stuff. <laughs> you know, do you ever get those and people invite you to join their groups and their whatever? So I have a bit of a criteria for joining groups, right? The first one, if it's a private group, no. Nah. See you later, because I like that total exposure and openness of things. And inclus inclusivity, is that the nature of the thing? And then the other one is if, um, is if it's personality-based, right? Because I like groups that are principle-based, not personality-based, which is the whole teaching of the course, really. Personality before principle. Uh, pri <laughs> the other way around. <laughs> principle before personality, right? And a few other things, but people keep sending me all this stuff. And some of those things are, um, you know, like Tony Robbins and um, those. And I don't want to shit on Tony Robbins. I'm just as an example, you know, but um, guys that do that motivational stuff. And it's cool. I really love that stuff. You know, I really love that stuff where they put you on the spot. And it's like all of a sudden you've got this 10 year drama. And then all of a sudden it's gone. Right. It's not particularly gone because the true healing happens miraculously by a shift in consciousness, a shift in the mind through prayer, right? Now, there's a difference. In the course, I forget what it, Jesus says exactly, but it's like a lasting change is something that occurs miraculously. It has to be a miracle because you're not interested fundamentally when, if you're a force student. You're not interested in changing the nature of your life in the world. That becomes a byproduct of changing your mind to um, 
in, in, in the idea of I'm coming to a recognition not only that there is no world, but, but that I am supported by a higher power. That's why I'm participating in a spiritual determination. I want to remember my father. I'm not the least bit interested in uh, finding a better way for me to exist in the world. Or, oops. <coughs> Mum and dad. So that's funny stuff. I sometimes forget I have a mum and a dad, but there's uh, <laughs> but there's a difference. So I'm not interested in healing my trauma. I'm not interested in uh, digging up my past thing that seems to have an effect on me now, so that I can have a better thing in the future. All I'm interested in is letting go of everything I think about either of those directives as past or future in my mind now miraculously so that i can transcend this temporal you know beginnings and endings sort of um reference for myself to have a more linear one up uh, not linear a vertical one right i'm making a shift this way not out there in the field of my dreams when i make the shift this way whatever needs to change out there will just change automatically all right so my concern is not that um, I was treated badly and I need to recover from that or any of those things. I'm healing an idea of being separate from source, right? The opportunities, however, to do that in my own mind show up as I'm being treated badly, as the triggers, as the catalysts. But I'm not healing the triggers and catalysts themselves. I'm healing what they represent in me. Okay, and it's easy to skip those, to skip that, and it's really subtle, right? It's easy, it's easy to miss that level, that ascension, that, that taking it up. It's easy to get caught up in the drama of out here because it's very, very, um, you know, mind-consuming, if that's a word. It's, it's very, uh, what do you call it when you're just preoccupied with something all the time? like a, a carrot, you dangle the carrot and you just can't take your eyes off it. What's that called? Oh, come on. Mesmerize? It's mesmerizing, I guess, yeah. Out there is very, very mesmerizing, good or bad, like neither, neither way of those, neither good or bad matters, but it's mesmerizing. And the mind easily gets caught up in uh, trying to adjust and trying to fix what's going on out there rather than taking it up. You know, so all those Tony Robbins and sorry, Tony, if I'm using you incorrectly in a reference here, but um, all of those sort of guys that do all that sort of um, dynamic speaking and, and empower your life and mindfulness and all of that stuff, it's only going on out here on the physical level. There's no reference, right? Like Jesus says, the miracle itself is unimportant, right? It doesn't matter. It's where it comes from that matters. Right? You're attempting to reorient your thinking and your consciousness so that it becomes referential with God, continually God dependent. Right? Miracle mindedness as such is just a temporary expedient in doing that. Does that make sense? So it's like all of the, it's like um, Doug, you were saying to me earlier this week about your friend and something, and you weren't sure that they were asking for help directly, but somewhere in your own mind, you were feeling that there was a call for love or a call for help or a call for something. It's like in those situations, it may be that you'll offer something out here, right? And one of my, one of my dearest teachers, um, Adele, used to sit with people, and she'd sit with me especially. I used to live just near her, and I'd go and see her in my early days when I had a problem or a drama going on that I couldn't really grasp. And she would simply listen to the story, and she would process it from this point, putting a finger on her nose, I'm not separate from what's going on here. And she would accept atonement for herself, right? She was an incredible healer. She would accept atonement for herself just through listening and hold that I was not separate from her. I'm a figure in her dream presenting her a script, an idea that she had previously asked me to play for her in, in that idea of being separate from God so she could take responsibility for it and offer me back a clean script, right? So I could 
journey on without the burden and so could she. And she would simply say to me, would you like to see that differently at the end? Right? It was incredible. It was the most incredible thing to say. Would you like to see that differently? Because then the onus is on whoever it is that's coming to you as let's say the patient, which isn't entirely accurate, but the onus would be on them to whether they would want to take on board something else that is outside of the spectrum of what they think their problem is. Right? Now, it may be that if they said yes, you would just offer them that, oh, well, this is just a dream. If they were familiar with the framework of that this is just a dream. If they weren't, you might have to start more at the ground level and sort of start looking at um, the cause and effect nature of time and you know the whole messy bucket of prawns. But um, there's always a place. It's like the whole healer's thing is accept atonement for myself, accept atonement for myself, right? So, but you're always making that reference, Doug, out of time, okay? So in my mind, there's no solution. Somebody comes to me and they're saying something, something, and I'm feeling a call for love. It's like, well, hang on a minute. This person is expressing what I think is an unsatisfactory situation. If I was in their shoes, this is how it would feel to me, right? And you still have memories of that. It's like people tell me things sometimes today and having done 25, 26 years of this, I don't really relate anymore. I know that there would have been a time I used to relate, but I can't find it. I try to put myself in their shoes and it's just like, Argh. and so I just keep my finger here, but there's literally no memory bank of certain things. But when there is, like I sit there and I'm like, listening, 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 and I'm just listening for that catalyst, okay? Of course, the whole story is a call for forgiveness, the whole, from beginning to end. There's no situation that could possibly be presented to me unless my own, my own healing was included in it, right? Two people don't come together for no purpose. The purpose of every encounter is whole. Therefore, I'm listening for that opportunity because I'm in an experience of denial of my holiness fundamentally, right? Having now made a new admission that I don't want that anymore, I'm about the business of listening for where it is that the opportunity to change the script comes in for me and for my brother, okay? So I'm listening, 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 and I'm keeping an open mind to what they're saying, knowing that none of it is real, knowing that none of it is true, but knowing that there's going to be an opening there somewhere if I just listen, right? Now, that has to be listening without judgment. So the judgment kicks in when I, and this is kind of like a, a paradox, when I think I can relate to what they're saying, it's because I'm judging it, okay? Now, there's no way out of that. All I can do is bring my mind back around. All I can do is recognize it and bring my mind back around to pure listening again, right? Without judging. Keep my mind, just keep bringing my finger back on my nose. As soon as I think, oh, yeah, I know what that is, I'm putting a conceptual reference into my listening and actually I stop listening, okay? And it's very, very difficult at first and even, even now sometimes because some people are so animated and um, uh, excited when they tell you stuff that it, it kind of draws you out of your listening into, into joining them in the drama, you know? And it's like, what? It's like I, I have this one person that comes into my tattoo shop and gets tattoos off me and she's just like, wow, she's a big energy. She's huge. She's a tiny little woman and she's just lights up a room. But she always lights up a room with a story about something, you know, it's like, and it's very, all of a sudden you have to pay attention to what she's saying because she's just so animated and like, but anyway, it, it makes you focus harder on listening, right? It makes you focus harder. So in the, fo in the focus, like I'm listening, 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 I'm listening for my catalyst. I'm not listening with the idea that I'm trying to solve their problem. Okay, I'm listening for what is this for me, All right? And you may have to listen for an hour and there may be just like two words or something and it'll be like, bam, bam. And if you're honest in your listening or if you're clear in your listening, you'll realize that they're presenting you an opportunity to heal something in your mind that you've been thinking about, concerned about, reading about, whatever, All right? It always shows up that way. 
you'll be saying, oh, I was just thinking about that. And I opened the course and there it is. <laughs> right? Again and again and again. Everything's always perfect. It's like an algorithm, you know, like you'd be talking about free energy or whatever. And then you turn on your phone and there's all these free energy, bloody whatever. You know, all these sorts of things, they just show up. So mind is like that. Mind, mind does that. So if there's a catalyst or if there's an opening there for remembering my father, it'll be presented again and again and again. Because all I'm, look, all I'm ever looking at in the reference outside of myself is the falsity of my belief that I'm separate from God. In the moment that that falsity no longer exists, there'll be no need for this vessel. Right? And I mean, exists as my belief in it, not exists as in, because it doesn't actually exist anyway. It's impossible. That's the paradox, though. The paradox is literally inescapable. You can't work this out by trying to escape the paradox. You can only realize the paradox or realize that point of finger on the nose in any given moment, situation, or encounter and ask for help. Okay. Here's someone that seems to be telling me a story about something. I seem to relate to the idea that there's a lack of love in there. How can there be a lack of love if God is everything? Boom, paradox. Right? What do I do with that? I need a miracle. In that, I'm healing my mind and automatically because that person or situation is not separate from my mind, I'm going to take a leap of faith and say, no, that's not separate. Right? I can be shown that it's not separate through the action of healing, right? which is a holy instant. Does that make sense? You guys are learning to become healers. You guys are learning to become teachers. And it's like whatever that looks like for you. I mean, we have this Zoom meeting and Tina, you were just saying you have other Zoom meetings and Doug, I'm guessing you do other stuff as well. It's like you involve yourself in whatever you're attracted to and drawn to automatically and it'll keep coming to you until the process is fulfilled in you, that unlearning and relearning. It'll keep showing up. And eventually you'll just get to a point where you realize, oh, I've got nothing left. I've got nothing I need to learn, nothing I need to say, because there's a constancy, a self-correcting constancy of um, singular consciousness that, that occurs in you and you'll recognize it. The more you recognize it, the more you'll be comfortable with it. And uh, but until you until you sort of form a familiarity or or a rekindling of that relationship, which is probably better, until you form that rekindling of that relationship in a, in a holy sense rather than out here, you're not looking to fix relationships out here. You're looking to fix a relationship you have with God, represented by a situation out there that you think you can understand. Right? You've taught yourself a weird language with weird symbols. So the healing has to show up in a weird way that only you understand <laughs> so that you can use it. Wouldn't be any good if uh, I spoke to you in Chinese and you didn't understand Chinese. No? <laughs> it means I don't speak very good Chinese. <laughs> but I know, I know enough to get around. <laughs> So I guess if I had to, if I had to impart anything or, or express anything out there that I need to learn, because like you always teach what you need to learn, is to not lose sight of the value of the goal. Okay. Especially when the world seems to be offering you things on your own terms. Okay. When things seems to be going your way, when it seems to be good and everything's roses and like, wow, isn't this great? Okay. Never take your finger off your nose because like pride goeth before a fall and anything that you're referencing externally that you're going to say is great is only the yang of the yin of the things that you think are not great. So look out, it's coming around the corner. <laughs> right? So the value of the goal is always based upon unfortunately based upon how much suffering I've had. If I'm sick and tired of my suffering, I'm going to value the goal a lot more than if uh, my life is roses. You know, it's like a millionaire doesn't want salvation. They've got everything. Why, why would you want salvation? Life is good. 
Bitches and money, bitches and money. I don't know that. I can't remember that. I can't remember that actual song, but. Ho, hey, ho. <laughs> That's a line in it. <laughs> bitches and money. I'm not a. I'm obviously not a rapper. Cash rules. I have, my, I have my hat though. I have my hat. Wait, I could. I could. Hey, ho. I got the I got the fashion. You do have the fashion. I got a I got a thing. I just don't have a big deer one thing on the bottom. <laughs> a big medallion. Remember that guy yeah. that used remember that guy that used to wear the clock? Flavor big... Flav. Yes. Really? Is that his name? I thought he, I thought his name was TikTok or something. No, Flavor Flav. Come on. Or now. Dr. Tom. No, really? Flavor Flav. Public enemy. Massive. Yes. Flavor Flav had the big clock. Yeah, massive freaking clock. So yeah. jump around. He was the hype man for a public enemy. <laughs> yeah, right. Cool. Uh, anyway, so remembering remembering the value of the goal. It doesn't have to be that you have to undergo a depth of suffering in order to give the goal value. Like Jesus simply says in the course, look at all the pathways offered by the world and you'll start to see how alike they all are to each other. They don't offer anything but death, right? You're being offered eternal life. Now, look at all the pathways in the world reflected off that offering. I've got this pathway out there, this out there. Oh, Tony Robbins is here today. I might go and see Tony Robbins or uh, who's that other guy that the motivational uh, little guy, curly hair, wears spandex. Woo, woo. Robbins, no. Tony. Richard Simmons? Yep. That's him. Yeah. You can do it. Do it. Be the best you can be. He was one of the original best you can be, but physically, he was like the dance. Was he jazz. really? Okay. You don't remember that? No, I just remember him being like, you know, being kind of, you know, bizarre with a, like an afro and, <laughs> yeah, and dancing. The afro I didn't know he was. Latex clothes. Yeah. And I think he like transitioned. Neon 80s. I think he's yeah. female. I think he's female. Or did he pass transition? Transition? Anyway. Right. Yeah, I believe he's female. He now. I think so. I don't know. I think he was probably female all along. He just didn't really realize. Oh, a little bit. <laughs> Never mind. Learn on these meetings. What's that, Doug? The things I learned during these meetings. <laughs> and now forget this. <laughs> and now forget that. <laughs> So looking at, oh man, these are so bright. I'm not going to eat the other one. I don't know how kids enjoy these in their lunchbox. They just soak up every bit of saliva in your mouth. Do they enjoy those? Mm. Do they? Okay. I, put, I used to put them in my daughter's lunchbox. They were one of her favorites. Oh, wow. Oh, that was they, a sweet picture I saw. They probably lost oh. all oysters since 2021. <laughs> Yeah, yeah 2022. No <laughs> 2021, 21st of January. Over a year. So looking, looking then at that idea that all the pathways of the world are the same, right? When you look at that totally, right? Now, this is what I'm always telling you guys. You have to activate yourselves, you have to force yourselves to look at things on a deeper level than just up here, on a deeper level than where you just look at it in the book and go, oh, yeah, they are all the same, right? That's got to really hit home because you can read that book a thousand times and it'll just be up here conceptually. You've got to read that book and the light bulb goes on. You go, holy crap. Like, if you hear one of those statements, like, all the pathways of the world are the same. If you hear that truly, man, the penny drops. It's almost a devastating realization to realize that no matter where you go and no matter what you do, you die at the end every single time. Right? The death of the body, it's like if the body actually died, it would be the death of God, but it's like, the death of the body as an illusion doesn't stop the illusion. 
It's like on a loop, right? You think that you think that the death of the body signifies the end of you, but it's not the end of you. You pop up again and again and again, right? How many times do you have to pop up to look at every pathway offered by the world to see that they're all the same? Now, let that be the total moment of suffering or the total moment of um, devastation for a second, right? The thing that anyone's fearful, and it's like having been fearful of it for a long time until the dark night of my soul. Um, and I love, um, what's that guy? <laughs> Oh man. I'm unmuting myself to get ready to answer. <laughs> yeah, you would know. It's just there it was God, not Carlos Castaneda. Oh. I mean, uh, I mean the singer, you know, Miriam, Barbie McGee, what's her name? She does it too. Um, Janice Joplin. So Janice Joplin's like mm. freedom's just another word for nothing else to lose. Right? Yeah. But you got to get to that point where you see you've got nothing else to lose right that's not a point down the track in the future that's oh. here. but because the mind is habituated to associating things with the past and the future it kind of puts it off in mind games that it plays to extend its suffering right that happens deliberately right and you won't even be aware of it. The ego will just say, oh, yeah, I'm free when I've got nothing else to lose. Well, maybe tomorrow I'll have nothing else to lose. And Jesus uh -huh. kind of lets off the hook. Jesus sort of says, maybe today, maybe tomorrow, Holy Son of God, you know, blah, blah, blah. The mind, when you're ready to undergo that total moment of devastation, you will. Mm -hmm. But that's what you're always putting off, realizing that your dream is just a dream. It's not reality realizing that the belief you hold in separation has no basis for, for, for a foundation of a, of a useful thought system to you because you can't hold it as an immortal. It, it's not immortal. You know, you can't hold it as an eternal frame of reference, which is what you're trying to do. Mm. I want to be God. That's the thing. I want to be God. Fuck you, God. And uh, I'll have my own world here. You're not invited, you know, so... Like Pinocchio. Right, exactly. I'm a real boy. <laughs> but you're not a real boy. There's no there's no wonder the witch and you don't get to do that. It's just like there's a miracle and you get to wake up from the delusion that this has any kind of credibility at all. I watched uh, I watched a series of Westworld yesterday. I'm on series three where she's in a dream within the dream or she's in a Westworld within the Westworld. And just re and she's just starting to realize that by breaking from the script, she can affect the entirety of the thing. It's really incredible. Like it's like it's a the way they've put it is so exactly causing miracles. She's just realized through doing something, and her partner has this kind of glitch, and she looks at him with the glitch and suddenly realizes that she's not awake in the real world, she's actually in another version of the dream. Because he's glitching. He's having a matrix glitch like eh, 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 like that. And she looks at him and goes, holy fuck. I thought I was awake. I thought this was the real world, but I'm actually still in another version of the dream. Right? And she starts to realize that by changing um, the programming, that the dream gets affected entirely. And to the point, I mean, science fiction, but to the point where she's able to stop the dream where they stop from getting killed and she can escape. Right? She can get out of the thing or she can actually begin to um, back influence the programmer. Right? It's kind of, it's kind of, you kind of have to watch it, but it's, it's like an amazing moment. And it's like you have those moments where you realize, and this is where if you're afraid of it, you're not going to have the moment, but where, where you realize that through utilizing the catalyst or through utilizing that trigger or that moment where you feel uncomfortable, right? you can actually change things. Now, it's an illusion of change, just as anything here is an illusion. Oh, hello, we've got Laurie on. And, um, but it's an illusion of change. Hey, Laurie, it's an illusion of change that actually serves the purpose of bringing you more 
peace because the goal of the course is inner peace. It's not an illusion of change that serves the purpose of making everything out here better. All right? It just brings you to a greater acceptability of the world exactly as it is, rather than thinking that you can be a better version of yourself or that the world needs to change or someone needs to hear something you have to say. I mean, you guys are entering, you guys are entering into this Zoom meeting under the premise that, and I don't know, you could be all just faking it, waiting for me to wake up. But, you know. <laughs> But I'm, but I'm assuming that you guys are turning up here because you've asked that there's something in our collaborative venture that is reminding you of this transition rather than this transition. Right? And that's why we come together. We come together to rekindle our eternal relationship rather than our temporal one. Right? So... But to do that properly, we have to be about the practice of it. We have to be about our father's business and apply the principle over personality, right? Principle, not personality, so that those shifts occur. And the shift, if it's not miraculous, it's not going to last, right? The ego loves to offer you something where you think you can feel better about yourself. I used to be a shithead and now I'm a good person because I give to charity or something like that, you know? All of this sort of stuff. I used to be selfish, but I've changed my ways. No, you've just adopted other ways that put off the recognition of the suffering of how it is you used to think about yourself before you realized you're an asshole. You know, I don't like to think of myself as an asshole. So rather than confront myself why I think I'm an asshole, I'll do something so I don't have to look at that. I'll give to charity or I'll do something else, right? But the, fundamentally, the arsehole is still there underneath, right? So it's a recognition of, um, hang on a minute, there's no point in putting on another veneer. There's no point in putting on another mask or adopting another identity. Let's just deal with the erroneous nature of the one that I find myself to be honestly, undergo that shift, which is that way, not out here in the world, thanks, Tony Robbins, but no thanks. And... Um, allow something miraculous to happen where in all of those um, reasons that I thought I had to act a certain way become unvalidated in me, all right? So it's not that my attack and defence mechanisms are being um, relieved from my thinking because my thinking is attack and defence, attack and defence, that's the basic nature of it, but they're being reinterpreted to suit my new purpose, so rather than thinking that I can actually get something by attacking someone else or defending myself from something will bring me safety, I'm seeing that I'm only attacking and defending myself from myself, which brings me back to the value of the goal. If the value of my goal is truly to remember my father through the adoption of a singular spiritual curriculum, right, a, a, a curriculum that brings on a singular perspective, then what am I defending myself against? Who am I attacking? Right. Then it becomes credible. If I'm not really valuing the goal, there's going to be this kind of like back door there where sometimes, oh, yeah, well, I'm attacking and defending because, and you'll attempt to justify the because in a spiritual frame. Right. I've heard, of, I've heard people tell me and I've had people tell me that um, there are justifiable fears. Right? An attempt to justify it spiritually. You know, there are justifiable fears that help guide you. It's like, there's no such thing. You know, and I, I can't put my finger on one at the moment. I mean, putting your hand on a hot plate, I'm afraid to put my hand on the hot plate. That's a justifiable fear. But it's like, it's not really a justifiable fear at all. It's just common sense. You don't have to frame it as something to be fearful of once you understand it. It's the same as the world. I don't have to frame it as something to be fearful and defend myself against once I understand that it's a projection of my mind that in my old um, perception of myself, I deliberately maintained an idea of separation from so that I could fulfill a purpose that was sinister and uncreative. 
as soon as you realize that there's nothing to defend against it's like oh i'm free now but the mind's habituated to flip flopping backwards and forwards between the old way of thinking and the new way of thinking so there's this process called mind training where again and again and again we brought our finger to our nose to realize that hang on i'm doing this to myself <laughs> And that'll go on and on and on and on and on until uh, the mind starts to do it for itself, until the mind starts to go catch on and be like, oh, I see what you're trying to do here. Um, I'll do that for you. And let's see if we get it right. So it's like as if you're collaborating with yourself, like that invisible friend, the ego, and you, right? It's like there's this kind of collaboration going on in there where the invisible friend has had no real... Um, guidelines other than to fuck shit up right in every way possible and then all of a sudden you're going hang on i'm done with that i don't want to fuck shit up anymore i want peace i want peace i want peace and your invisible friends going no you told me to fuck shit up that's what i'm doing you know it's like if you want peace i'm gonna fuck that up too i'm gonna fuck up peace right and it's like well hang on a minute if you're gonna if you're not gonna help me i'm gonna you know and you have this whole internal dialogue I'm going to find Jesus. Jesus will help me. Right? And Jesus will help you. Right? Or, or the Holy Spirit will help you. And then eventually the invisible friend goes, oh, man, you're not playing with me anymore. You and your new friend, the Holy Spirit, God damn it. It's like, all right, I get it. I'll, I'll start to, you know, because otherwise it has nowhere to go. What is it? You're just gonna, it's like a kid that's not playing by the rules in the sand pit. And then finally, they're sick and tired of sitting there playing by themselves and they realise they have no choice but to play by the rules. Otherwise, what's the point? No one's going to play with them. You know? <laughs> so eventually, that part of your mind that's vouching for separation begins to start to reluctantly vouch for the singular nature of life. Right? But it seems to be it seems to be a kind of a sacrifice initially until you realize that peace is actually really good. You know? So it's not that you're it's not that you're validating the ego so much, but you're retraining the part of the mind that believes in the reality of its thought system. Right? You may say, well, that it's kind of paradoxical because it's like, how can you validate something that doesn't exist? It's like, well, let's look where we find our feet. I'm being told this is just a dream, just an illusion, and that uh, the paradox is that it can't possibly exist because God's eternal and God's creation doesn't have birth and death and all of this stuff in it. It's spirit. It's formless, created in its likeness. But I find myself here. Right? So we deal with the falsity of that belief where it meets us or where we meet it or where we hold it in our mind. It's like Jesus is telling me one thing. Yeah, but that doesn't line up for me, Jesus. You know, Jesus is telling me there is no world, but to me it looks damn sure like there's a world. So I have to deal with my belief in the idea that I think the world is real um, to whatever degree that is for me individually and apply the principle of forgiveness, the action of forgiveness to it until such time as my mind begins to see the glitch, begins to get the the results of applying that forgiveness, which is the liberation of it from um, continually having to attack and defend against what I think is real. Does that make sense? So it's like, it's just this ongoing process. It's like he says, your greatest need right now is mind training. Mind training is your greatest need. And if you forget that it's your greatest need, um, you're going to slip off out there into the Tony Robbins world and try to become a better version of yourself rather than actually um, allowing yourself to be dissipated into the nothingness from which you came so that your true self can flower, your true self can emerge, your true self can be revealed to you. It's not a path that everybody wants to walk on. Two in 10,000 will hear this. The road... The road is steep and hard and there are a few on the road that you'll find, you know. It's like, he's not kidding when he says that. <laughs> he's, he's, he's not underestimating that. <laughs> Two in 10,000 will hear this. It's like, to hear it on any level other than the superficial surface level of consciousness, that's a big undertaking. 
That's why we do these lessons again and again and again, trying to hear it, trying to connect with it. It's like Jesus is telling me there is no world. So how do I let that in? How do I let that in? He says there is no world. Not just, not just the world that I've made on top of the meaninglessness of the world that exists, but the world itself, right? In the earth text, it says that the world was made as a forum where minds could come to undergo this experience. But prior to coming to the world, you still existed as a formless entity. Let's say, we'll call it loosely spirit for a second. Um, for want of a better reference, drifting out there in the cosmos. Right? All of a sudden, Jesus comes along and goes, hey, you, get to get to earth, get to earth. You guys need to undergo this thing because we're, we're about the resurrection now. We're about healing. We're about whatever. And you can't do it out here drifting along in la-la land. You've got to get down somewhere and get a body and undergo this whole transition because we need to train you to fit back into where you came from. Hmm? It's like someone who's been in prison for a long, long, long time needs a moment of repatriation back into society. They forget the rules and the expectations and the whole jargon of society. And they come, it's like the military too, guys that have spent a lifetime in the military. And then they come out and they try to integrate back into normal civilian life. They have a very hard time of it. And they often have like these halfway uh, veterans groups and things like that to help bridge that gap, right? This is a bridging of the gap. A Course in Miracles is a mind training to bridge the gap between the temporal identity and the non-temporal identity. It's like Adi Da used to say, you're going from an idea of yourself as being a man to a God-man, right? Or Master Teacher would say, from Homo sapien to Homo illumina, right? That's not, a, that's not a bridge or a gap that you can just decide to, to happen. Um, I'll wake up today and I'll be homo illumina rather than homo sapien. You know? That may be a decision that you'll make, but actually deciding it and having that process going on whereby you're capable of managing that shift is a whole nother thing. It's like you've been in the military so long that you need this kind of breaking it down explanation of where you've been. You've been at war with yourself. And now we're going to just gently awaken you from that idea that that was necessary. And we're going to see that through the idea that I'm looking now that um, I've been at war with myself, I can choose not that. I don't know how to choose for something other than that, but I can at least choose not to be at war with myself. Right? Now, that's going to... The how-to is the miracle. How do I not be at war with myself? I need a miracle. Because if I think I can dictate how to not be at war with myself on my own terms, not knowing what it is that I am, I'm just going to make up more of the same shit wearing a different uniform. My civilian clothes will become the new uniform and I'll drag my, my, my military mentality out into my new family or out into whatever. And you actually see that plenty of times where the father will come home from the war and treat the kids and the wife as if they're just in the military with him rather than him integrating back into the, you know, the non-military family. And that's a hard bridge to cross. It takes help. It takes a lot of love and it takes a lot of time and perseverance and determination and all of those sorts of things. My grandfather, I remember, was a classic example of that. He was 50 years in the Navy, 25 in the Royal Navy in England and 25 in the Merchant Marine. He did nothing his whole life but take orders. Right? Take orders, take orders, take orders. Everything was a certain way, a certain thing. There was no free thinking in his own mind, none. It had to be done according to the book, to the letter of the thing. And he was a stickler for it. And when he came home, um, he could only stand it at home for like a week at a time with his wife. He couldn't stand it because he had to think for himself. You know? He would always be off back out to sea. And I remember my grandmother having a conversation with my mother once in the kitchen. Um, she was heartbroken because she realised she would never really get her husband back. 
he was married to the sea, he was married to the Navy and all of that sort of thing. And it was that thought system. Because he didn't have to think for himself, it was easy. He just did what he was told. And he was happy. He'd sort of surrendered his idea of free will and just accepted that. That's kind of what we're doing, right? I'm, but, but in reverse. <laughs> I'm surrendering my idea of free will so that my will and God's will become the one will, which is unconditional. In that, there's no limitation on me whatsoever. It doesn't matter whether I think for myself or don't think for myself. It doesn't matter whether I judge myself or don't judge myself. The pointlessness of judgment always flips back around to judging for my truth, judging for my higher self. Once, once you realize that the story or the thinking that takes you away from God is the same one that brings you back, you're kind of done. You can't hear this and make up a story about yourself that's not embroiled in this mind training. I think I'm a body, blah, 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 blah. Even the recognition that you think you're a body brings me back to, oh, hang on a minute, right? It's like the finger does this and then it automatically comes back. The finger does this, automatically comes back. It doesn't matter how much you judge, don't judge all of these things. It's going to always come back. Right? The story of the prodigal son is broken down into the moments, into the seconds and minutes of your experience in the world. It's like I'm always wandering away from God and then coming back, wandering away and coming back. Once you realize the benefit of the goal in coming back, you learn to abide more and more and more. Every time I see that I have a miscreative thought and I project it out there and I'm getting the results of my thinking, that's the same thinking that reminds me that I'm being miscreative in my thinking and brings me back to God again. <laughs> you can't fuck this up. You can't get it wrong. Right? But you can delay. Right? And you can have a tantrum. God damn it. Why, why, blah, 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 blah. I just want this one little thing, Jesus. This one grain of sand. But no, give up the world and follow me. Even that last little grain of sand, give it up, drop it, come home. It's funny stuff. So fundamentally, people turn up in Zoom meetings and in ashrams and temples all around the world, and they'll get what they can take at any given time in the process of actually hearing. How much am I going to let myself hear there is no world? How far down that rabbit hole am I going to go today? When you're truly done with the world, you take somebody who's had a really tough life, like grown up in Africa on through the famine and watched everybody die. And it's like, you know, it's like Dean. I don't know if you guys remember Dean, brother Dean, right? So Dean has lost every member of his family in a period of 18 months, all his brothers and his father and his mother is incredibly old and sick now. Like his catalyst, his propulsion, his, his determination is just resolute. He has those, like, he's in a constant mental breakdown, constantly. He can't take it. He feels there's nothing in the world for him. He might as well go and join them on the other side. <laughs> But at the same time, he's also realized that doesn't help the greater good. It's like, while there's breath in my lungs, let me use it to, to represent something else in a place that was designed to deny it, you know, however that looks. So the, the harvest is bountiful and the workers are few. So, is that the right thing, Tina? Did I get that right? Yeah. That's the parable of the workers in the vineyard. Sounds the harvest in my, in my father's vineyard, the harvest is bountiful, but the workers are few. Yeah. It's like Jesus in the course. I need you guys who are already in the dream or in on the world, in the world, to represent this. It wouldn't do. It's like where he says the angels were sent in and had to be drawn back because the denial of man was too strong. It's like, well, we're like double agents. You know, all of us in this, we're like double agents. We're here in the same skins as everybody else, but representing a whole different thing. It's like we're the underground. We're the Jesus underground. 
what's his name? Gary talks about that in um, Disappearance of the Universe, the Jesus Underground. And so that's how this kind of works. Anyway, Laurie, what's going on with you? You're looking good. Oh, thank you. Well, oh my God, so much is going on with me. First, I apologize <laughs> for being late. It's like I, I'm laughing at myself because I've been binge watching your most recent sat songs that you've had the last couple few days here. I've been binge mm. watching today and I'm going, I am so ready. I just, I really miss being there. And Tina's been doing such great work and Anna's been doing such great work. And I just want to get through this shit. And I can't wait till seven o'clock comes tonight so I can get my book all ready to read. And I've been, I've been stalling time because I've been waiting for seven o'clock. And then I log on a few minutes early thinking, well, I can ask Tina what other night you meet. I'll have time. You guys are already talking and I felt like <laughs> the kid that showed up at the birthday party late and had gotten the time wrong, you know? We started like, early. Oh, uh, we well, no, started up, early. You start at six? We start at six when we do the first, you know, the 20, but he just happened to be here. And I was thinking I should oh, drop okay. something in the chat. Well, so yeah. I, I thought I was going to show up at seven. I thought I was thinking that you started reading at seven. And so I was oh. just all screwed up. So the ego is really playing tricks on me going, ha, 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 ha. You think you're going to deal with some shit tonight, don't you? <laughs> I'll tell you, my shit has been up. And um, I heard you say something in Dave recently in one of the older uh, videos that I watched where you were telling your story of when you had your enlightenment yeah, and the state you went into and how grateful you were that there were people surrounding you that understood because, you know, you would want to go just screaming and laughing and naked through the streets, you know, that people don't want to keep yeah. their clothes on, that they feel this great, amazing yeah. feeling, okay? And I went, oh my God, that is how I was told I acted as a little child. Right. <laughs> they couldn't keep clothes on me. I, I, was, I was a handful. I was hyperactive. I was, you know, I was all over the place. I was joyful. I loved people. I started walking at four months old at a year and a half. I was climbing over the fence and running up the alley. I mean, they just couldn't contain me. So they would contain me. I mean, I wore, they put harnesses on me whenever they take me out. They took the bottom out of the playpen so that they could keep me in the house and I could just bump into things without breaking shit. And, you know, so I learned and I, and they put phenobarbital and whiskey in my milk bottle to make me go to sleep at night, you know? And so I discovered alcohol and drugs at a really young age to calm me down food food was my go-to you know anything that would slow me down because i got the message that my energy was bad that i was dangerously destructive and it freaked everybody out and there was something intrinsically wrong with me and that's been my main theme i realized some years ago that still plays you know shit keeps coming up I'll start feeling good. My life's coming together. I feel like I'm spiritually doing really well. I, at one point I had a, a meditation practice. I would sit for two hours at a time and have amazing heart explosive things happen. And I fell down a flight of stairs and screwed myself all up and was in a hospital for a long time. And it's, it's affected me physically you know, for 20 years. It's stuff like that. So I have this thing that whenever things start to get good and I start to feel like I'm finally breaking through the ego stuff, I, I sabotage it. And I know it's that fear and that guilt. And um, it's like, I just want to be done with this shit. I really want to be done with it. You know, I just, yesterday I celebrated 42 years of being clean and sober and I've been working 12 steps all these years and I'm thinking, 
you know, and uh, yeah, baby, you've come a long way, but that fear and guilt are still driving. They are behind the wheel on the bus and I don't want them there anymore. You know, I've had some amazing spiritual experiences. I know what that feeling of, of God's peace is. I've been washed in it. I know what it is. Damn it, I want it. I want to be, I want to share it. It is so beautiful. It is so beautiful. So other than that, Dave, there's nothing going on with me. No, stay in that. Stay in that. Yeah. Look where you're at with it right now. You feel it? Yeah. See, feel that in your chest, like it's all choked up and everything. Now yeah. breathe in, breathe into that. Take a deep breath. Stay in that place. Don't try to not feel that. Don't try to make that be okay and you can just keep talking and you'll feel better about it again. Stay in that place where it's like emotional. That's an honest place. Just stay there. Don't try to get out of it. <sighs> Don't try to work it out. Don't try to examine it. Just stay there. Let the Holy Spirit do what needs to be done, not you. Draw that circle. In the desert, and you're there with all your pain. There it is. You're there with all your fear, all your guilt. There is nothing wrong with that. That's why we're here. Sit there. Let it happen. Let it happen. Go deeper if you can. Push. Give it a push. Feel how it makes you feel. It's all not true. It's all an illusion, but you find yourself in it anyway. Let's deal with it where you find it. <laughs> You're trying to get to the bottom of it, Laurie. Go right to the bottom of it. Push. Look under the waterline and see how big that iceberg is. Look under the waterline and see how big that iceberg really is. You can't deal with it by yourself. It's your job to give it to God. Let go and let God. Let go and let God. When you've gone as deep as you can go. When you've gone as deep as you can go, give it to the Holy Spirit. Here, take this from me. Take this. I have no use for this. Whatever it is that comes to you to say or to, you know, as an action of your mind. Here, Father. Take this. You don't even know how to give it, really. You don't even know how to let go of it. It's there because you don't want to let go of it. It's there because somewhere you made a decision that it was valuable. Fear and guilt is valuable to you because it helps you to fulfill the goal of maintaining separatist belief. It's like, oh, I must have been crazy. What I've done to myself. Look at all this crap. Look at all this energy, this miscreative dark light that I've got down here in the basement of my consciousness that I'm now experiencing. I refuse to adjust to it, Laurie. Stay there in that place. You're in charge. And the last remaining power, the last remaining power you have is the power of decision. Choose for your healing. Forgiveness. Choose for love and choose not to step out of that circle. You stay there until it's done. You stay there and stay there and stay there. I don't care if it takes all day. All day. I don't care if it takes 40 days. Breathe. Good. Keep going. Push deeper. Let yourself Feel it. It's incredibly valuable to be in touch with guilt and in touch with fear. Up till it had nothing to do with it. You didn't know what the hell about it. Good. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Ha <laughs> <laughs>
Boom. Yeah. Come on, push. Don't examine it. Don't examine it. Just stay there. Feel, feel, feel. <laughs> Go on, let it happen. <laughs> Take a breath. You've got a whole lifetime of that shit in there. Look at the, look at the story you just told about yourself. I was a kid. It goes right back. It's deep. It's one of those lifelong denial jobs. It's not just like something someone said to you in the supermarket. Stay there and look at it. Look at that little girl. Look at that little girl with the restrainer on, the lead or whatever. creative visualization with me for a second if you want to close your eyes stay in that energy stay there in that place where you can feel it i want you to look with open eyes at a little girl close your eyes i mean open eyed in your mind in your mind's eye look at that little girl Look at the harness that they put on her. Look at it. Feel it. I want you to imagine yourself as the grown woman that you are now, making the choice for liberation, for love and for forgiveness. And I want you to see yourself going over to that little girl, undoing the clip on that harness and letting her dance and be free and letting her be herself. Try to see yourself doing that. Let her dance and be free. Let her dance and be free. She's going to dance and dance and skip and skip. Out the back door of your mind into the light. Are you ready? Are you willing to let her go? To let go of her glory? Watch her go. In your mind's eye, watch her skipping and happy and free out of the back door of your mind into the light. Let it go, Laurie. <laughs> Say goodbye and let her go. Let her go with your gratitude. <laughs> let her go.
Healing is an idea. God is an idea. Freedom is an idea. These ideas have to be more valuable to you than your own old ideas. I was imprisoned. I was put on a leash. I was a little girl. All of these things, they make up a story, which isn't true. Wasn't true then, isn't true now. But they perpetuate a belief in bondage, they perpetuate a belief in separation. You're a child of God. You're free already. You've always been free. Free to be in bondage or free to be skipping down the street. Free to be told you're too much or free to be accepted as you are. It's always been your choice. Now we're choosing again. Now we're choosing for not that. I don't know how to choose for something else, but I can choose not that and just let it go. <laughs> just stay in that, Laurie. Just stay in that for a minute. Keep your eyes closed and breathe. You'll probably feel it a little bit like a pulse. It'll just keep coming back a bit. There'll be some residue and whatever. It's like ripples in a pond. When the ripples are finally done, you'll see the reflection clearly. Yeah. The journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. I choose to take that step today. I choose to let go now. I choose to let the past skip off down the street into the light, into the sun, to be what it is, for the future to remain a mystery and for me to exist and to be and to find myself in the here and the now where life is actually happening to me. I don't need a story about my past to justify my present condition. It's never going to be true. I don't need the potential of my future to give who I think I am now value. That's never be true this is a dream i'm just waking up from a dream <clears throat> breathe <laughs> good to laugh. <laughs> away the tears <laughs> good oh <laughs> Oh, <laughs>
<laughs> Just stay there. Just stay there and breathe. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you, Father. <sighs> Good. <sighs> it's a whole bunch, isn't it? sacred something's just occurred in your own mind okay something has just taken place about 20 seconds ago jesus stepped in behind you there in the room where you're at and stood beside you and put his hand over your head he's gone now by the way but Something occurred. Don't be out there talking about it. Don't make up a story about this Zoom meeting, nothing. Just keep it sacred, okay? okay? When you feel emotional, go back into exactly the same place that you're at now. Take the time. Make effort. Put yourself in there. And remember, your ego is going to try and talk you out of it, Okay? Sometimes it takes usually about three days for a shift to kind of like settle in, just sort of like, it's like you'll have moments where you want to flash back to something, but it's not there. And there's, it takes a minute for you to recognize that it's not there anymore because the habit of looking for it is still predominant. Right? It's like 12 step, work the program till it works you. Something just worked in you. We'll call it release for one, for one of, other words to talk about and in something just worked in you which is now at work to do what it needs to do in you don't get in the way of that let it happen let all the dominoes fall okay don't be surprised if you get little upheavals of emotionality over the next two or three days okay you will ask tina she'll tell you <laughs> <laughs> right just let it be let it be and breathe and draw your circle and feel that emotionality process it just be still with it and give it to the holy spirit just keep giving it keep handing it over handing it over okay bring your mind back to peace not through an action of trying to decide what that is but through an action of letting go what is not that in you and drink plenty of water. <laughs> I just feel so grateful to that little girl. Right. She Ready? She got a lot of shit. Stop, stop. Ready? Stop. Don't reference the story. She's gone. Okay. okay. Ready? Let her go. Okay. Don't back into your framework. Let her go. You're going to keep, like I just said, you're going to keep trying to look for the story. You're going to keep trying to figure it out and look at where that little girl fits in now. She's gone. The habituation of your ego is going to want to make up a story about it in the light of healing and in the light of forgiveness. Just let it go. All right? That's the past. It's done. You just released all that mostly. Mind training. Your greatest need now is mind training. You have to train yourself to stay here. That's what 
references you have for the past or the future, let them go. Here and now, here and now, here and now. I and my father are one. That's the relationship that matters. Okay. Breathe. Give up the world and follow me. Give up the world. <clears throat> Job, Laurie Scott. Partner <laughs> of the dream. Doug, what about you? You've been very quiet there in your comfortable yeah. chair. <laughs> <laughs> well, that story I told myself about that gentleman who was feeling uh, that he couldn't find physical attention. Right. Well, <laughs> that, that kind Go. of, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I was really feeling for him. You know, I'm saying this. Right. Joking. Yeah. And, right. And I could feel my heart, you know, going out to him. And he seemed so, you know, worthy of affection and love and attention. And, right. and uh, so that stirred up a few things. And yesterday or this morning or so, I, I just got uh, really um, upset that I couldn't have a reflection of this goodness and love and uh, you know all the things that I already told you about and attention. And yeah. I... I really angry very angry at the world <laughs> and and really really caught up in hating just you know the i've had it with the world i just i'm not getting anything out of it i i really would love to have you know just somebody say something nice to me you know even just as simple as gee doug you know you're that's a fine pair of shoes you have, or gee, you know, you're so pleasant to have, a, you're so, you're so pleasant to have around Doug. Gee, you're a nice guy. And, you know, it's been so long since, you know, I've had any of that. So I decided to kind of hate everything. And it, it upset me so that I had to completely have an emotional experience which happened this morning or yesterday and Good. I gave gave into all the emotion behind it and you know it's I don't mind getting upset at all I mean I prefer it over the the dream I was having and I was able to you know come out of it and you know jo you know get back into the nothingness the reality of just absolutely you know nothing going on but a sense of peace that sort of thing and uh so today was just a bit of residue i felt kind of almost like uh you know an alcoholic that i i, dra I drank so much of this poison that today i had just a, a residue of a distaste that was a lingering distaste of the world and even the Zoom meeting tonight, it's like, I'm not going to go to, you know, I didn't say this out loud, but you're part of it. I'm not going to go to this fucking Zoom meeting. You know, I've got nothing to offer. I don't believe in anything. I'm just fucked up, fuck them and all. And then, you know, I really wanted to be here. So that's <laughs> what. That's good. I knew that it came <laughs> I knew, I knew it had come around. So like I, when you were telling me that story, I'm in the same situation. I don't know that I'm actively looking at it as consciously. Maybe I'm in denial of it, but I, I was putting my finger on my nose going, I have these thoughts. I know about these thoughts. I, I have an affinity with how that feels and stuff. So I'm taking responsibility for it in that, you know, but uh the manifestation of how you're dealing with it, it doesn't really particularly matter. I mean, I would, I always ask, you know, do you want help with that or whatever? But uh, 
looking at it from my own perspective, and I had this little thought in the back of my head, oh, Doug's going to put his finger on his nose in a minute and he'll start laughing, you know, but uh, <coughs> the process of the process of that will be whatever it is. It'll just look like however it looks like. Sometimes there's an orchestration of things that has to come around before the finger goes back on the nose. Yeah. Like you said, you were sitting in being angry at the world and whatever and all of that sort of stuff. But the, the other thing is that there's no reason... Hang on, flip back a second. If you're looking at those things as the idea of having a, a relationship or a whatever with the idea of validating who you think you are, then it's going to have to show up in some way that you can recognise just so you can realise that that's false validation. Uh. So the only validation that can ever truly occur and ever satisfy you is God's validation of you as being his beloved son in whom he is well pleased, right? Here's Doug, my son in whom I'm well pleased. But everything outside of you, it's like I look at the idea, it's like, well, I haven't been in a relationship now for 18 months and I don't really feel called to be in one. Sometimes I think that would be nice if there was someone around and whatever, same sort of thing that you were just saying. But at the same time, I'm happy within myself just being myself. I don't feel like I could offer anyone something out of an idea of needing to fill the void or fill the gap or, or fulfilling or validating anything about myself. So from that point of view, it's like, I really don't know. I'm just going to let it be divine, be every, everything be divine in the recognition that I'm already in one relationship with everything that seen rightly verifies my um dreamer of the dream perspective in its entirety you know? and that's enough like that's got to be the bottom line but all of the other all of the other stuff you know where um the reflections of my dream let's say someone will come to me and say something that i resonate with and i put my finger on my nose all of that stuff's only temporary all of that stuff sort of falls away as i use the catalysts that are contained within it for my own healing to get me to the point where i see that i'm in an I'm already in an existential relationship with everything. Yes, it finally came down to that, you know, after it took a day or two to to wind up That's and then quick. to get the, and then to wind down off of it. And and when I finally felt that peace, it was like, well, I already have that connection with everything and this right. divine divine connection. And then I was able to experience re-experience that again and uh and that was quite nice <laughs> that is quite nice <laughs> quite quite nice as an understatement <laughs> right yes right it's it's either you know complete hell or you know once you have this experience the world and all the desire for it and that which you're, you know, you're looking for and feel frustrated about or conflicted over, you know, and it's that immersion. And then all of a sudden it all just, all that just disappears and you're back feeling, you know, whole and healthy and happy again. You know? and, yeah. And it takes, uh, it takes a minute for that sometimes. Yeah. A minute for that to happen. And uh, so that's my story. Ready? <laughs> right. That's a good story, though. It doesn't. It doesn't seem to me like listening to your story. It doesn't seem to me like there's much juice left in it for you. You know, like it's kind of no. like a, a remnant of a story that. Yeah. I wonder if you're thinking it meant something, you know. Right. But what happens? You have these remnants. They're like just vague. Like Jesus says, your illusions will disappear like mists before the sun. It's like yeah. somewhere that is still trying to see something in the mist. Right. See if there's still something there in the mist, but the sun, you can you can tell it's vanishing. And then there becomes this kind of like, is it still there? Do I still have it? It's like Laurie's story of the little girl. It's like, is she still there in bondage in my mind? Am I still using that story to perpetuate a current reference of myself or not? You know? And it's like, if you're honest and let the healing happen, 
It's like grasping at mists that are disappearing before the sun. It's like, wow, it's gone, it's done. I don't need to, I don't need to do that to myself anymore. And it gets kind of nice, like that's the place where, where there's a recognition that I'm supported comes in. That's where it comes from. Yes. Like, wow, I used that situation and that story to fill a void in my life that I call my life. I'm using that term loosely. Yeah. I used the story to fill up a file, a filing cabinet in my life because all of those filing cabinets, if they're empty, they're not going to represent my belief in separation. But when I've got something in them, you know, I can continually refer to those to maintain my identity. Yes. Yeah. Right? Letting go of your identity is a bitch. Who, who the hell wants to do that? Like the Sufis call it the death of the ego. It's like, does anybody get up in the morning and go, right, I'm going to die to my ego today? <laughs> Maybe two in 10,000. <laughs> today, I'm going to jump out of bed and like throw myself on the sacrificial altar of love and disappear forever and never having existed. But that sounds like fun, not. Like whoever does that. <laughs> But that's like I was saying, you know, like you see the value of the goal. You got to see how you got to see how all the pathways of the world are the same, or you're never right. going to want to. Right, right. It finally, uh, I, you know, I said to myself, you know, what is it? And this was, you know, for my healing. I said, you know, you're you're never going to kiss anybody again. You're, nobody's ever going to hold your hand. You know, nobody's ever going to tell you that they love you. And it's like once I got like that's. That was the, the catalyst I needed to be okay. Once I said those things and felt what it was like, I was like, oh, I'm going to be okay now. You know, I'm, I'm more than that, or I don't need that. Or it just felt, felt good to throw those out there. All right. You know, it was like the saddest thing I thought, because there's so, so much conditioning about, and I'm not, <laughs> really big, I'm not really big into like falling in love and long-term relationships or this, but, and that, but it is nice to have this sense of, you know, this love or connectedness or what have you. Uh, but it was quite helpful when I said I'll never have it again. It, I felt okay now. I, now I'm okay with it. Right. Once you accept, once you accept something, it's done. Yeah. It's while you're still toying with it in your mind that it torments you. No, I know. It's so true. <laughs> so when you think of Doug now, think of me as just, you know, without, <laughs> without the other, you know, I'm sitting in the sun up on the, the highway, reaching out, you know, just hoping somebody will, you know, come by and grab my hand and hold me forever. Right. And then, then we can have. That's a already good, actually uh, happened, Doug. No, no, I know that's the that's the laugh. You know that it it's already happening. Ah, it's the, right, is the joke is the joke on me. Right, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that was a, that was a good just one. Remembering right? to laugh, it it's is a good one. one. It's as good as any. We're just remembering to laugh. You know, yeah. So I, got, I look back on a journey that's already over, imagining that I'm taking it again. Yeah. You know? Once, once you're awake in the dream, it's like, oh, I get it. Right. Really, really, I have this privileged position now where I can recognize within myself that I'm, I'm watching something take place that's already yeah. over. Yeah. I'm watching how it is that I woke up. Not I, Dave, I conscious, I mind, I whole, whole, you know? Yeah. Dave, Dave doesn't wake up. Dave, Dave doesn't exist. It's like in the moment that Christ Dave, let's say for as a, other, as a higher reference, as the moment that Christ Dave awakens, temporal Dave ceases to exist in its entirety, never having existed at all. And it's like, holy cow, I'm watching my own, um, what do you call that? Demise, my own, uh, not demise, because that has a sense of loss or something about it, but my own um, metamorphosis. Yep. You know? from homo sapien to homo illumina, it's like a butterfly. I'm watching myself go into the pupa as a caterpillar, 
knowing that at some point it's inevitable that I come out the other end as a butterfly, right? Even before I go into the pupa, it's already a given. It's already a given that I was destined to be a butterfly. That's how beautiful it is. I'm seeing something that's already happened. It's like when people are running a race, you know, in the Olympics and they run around and around whoever comes first. It's like even before the guy fires the gun, the race is finished. Somebody won. Somebody did it. Somebody crossed the line first. And all of the people in that race who came not first allowed that person to be first. So really the whole group of them ran across the line together. See how that works? Yes. Right? Without everybody else, that guy that came first is pointless. Came first against what? With who? What, what's the big deal? You know? <laughs> so it's like Jesus already resurrected and he said, what's occurred in me is inevitable in you. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. Your time will come when you will also undergo this metamorphosis, this transformation. You will put on new garments. You're literally living in the actual process of putting on the new garments right here and now. This is what it looks like. We don't have uh, fish and, and loaves and that. We have all these other different foods now. and We don't have robes. We have other clothes and things. But this is what it looks like. A Zoom meeting. Do you think Jesus would have foreseen this Zoom, this technology, this whole thing going on where, you know, we're literally like the disciples all wandering along with Jesus going, do you know what he's talking about? I don't know what he's talking about. What's this forgiveness? You know, and then maybe we'll apply. It. We're literally like those guys. Those guys are trying to work it out. They thought Jesus had come to liberate them from the Romans and lead some kind of revolution about halfway through when they were far enough from home that they realized they couldn't get home because they had no food without Jesus. They had no choice but to continue to follow Jesus, right? It's like, well, what if we... Jesus is crazy. What if we just leave him now? How are we going to get home? We won't have enough food. You know, whatever. But I don't want to preempt the disciples here, but you get the idea. You know? So it's like at a certain point in this, you're in so deep, it doesn't make sense to go back, right? <laughs> so there's no, there's no going back. There's no going back. You can't do it. A, a, a little caterpillar can't go back from a butterfly to be a caterpillar again. Right. Like it's a done deal. The fix is in. You can't fuck it up even if you wanted to. Just stay in the vibration of this that offers you the max benefit of uh, being able to take advantage of what it is that, that Jesus is holding out. Like in Laurie's case, I have no clue what that was, but I just saw his hand go over the top of her head like that, like something something there i'd be interested to rewind this zoom when we see if i see it again i don't know maybe it was just i remember once um i was sitting my friend josie i'm pretty sure it was josie she's on my friends page in my thing list i was sitting at her place we went out together like as a relationship thing for about a year or 18 months whatever it was and i used to go to her place for coffee right we'd we'd go and have coffee, whatever. And she had this thing, like she was kind of like a visionary. She had this thing. We were, we were both attending the Senate together and everybody's going through this stuff and having stuff going on, releasing and healing and visions and all sorts of miracle things. She would have this thing where she would see things, right? Like one time I, she came and called me. I don't know why she called me, but anyway, she was guided to call me. She said, there's a ghost in my daughter's bedroom. She had a three three bedroom apartment upstairs, downstairs thing. And so I came and like, what the hell do I do with a ghost? What I don't know nothing about ghosts, right? I'd seen The Exorcist, but <laughs> so I said okay. So I went to her place. It was after meditation. I went to her place and we're having coffee, whatever. And her daughter Jamie was uh, actually, I think her daughter wasn't there, but there was someone else there. I can't remember who it was. And I said, all right, we've had coffee. I said, well, let's go have a look at this ghost. You know, I said, is the ghost still there? And she said, well, I can't actually see a ghost, but there's a cold patch in the room, right? And I walked into her daughter's bedroom. The three of us went in there. And sure enough, right in the middle of the room, there was this like icy cold patch of air just hanging in the room. And I got a shudder. I walked through it, you know, and I, Whoo! I, I didn't know that it was a ghost, but I just felt, you know, when they say someone walked on my grave and you get that tingle up your back. So I felt that, that was, it was so strong. 
and uh, I said to her, close the door, and we slid the window shut. We're living in the tropics. It's, you've got to have the doors and windows open because let the air through. And we turned on the lights. There was a lamp in the room light. We turned on the lights, and I invited whatever the energy was into my own association so that when I went to the next meditation, I could release it into the light. And uh, it actually hung around with me for quite a while. Wow. So the next, the next day, or it might have been two days after, I was walking up the beach and Josie was coming the other way and she was about 150 metres away. We used to go up and down the beach from town back to where she lived because it was easier than walking through all the streets, you know, Byron Bay. We live right on the beach. And when she got close to me, she's, she said, I, I had this feeling of being followed around. I kept feeling like someone was following me. She said, where did that, where did that person go that was with you? And I said, what do you mean? And she goes, there was like a little child with you, a little Aboriginal boy or girl, whatever, following you along. And then they just disappeared. And that was the energy that I felt. And then we found out later that her apartment, like there was a complex of about eight apartments, was actually built on the site of an old burial site for Aboriginal people. Oh, you know? God. I know. It was so bizarre. But I remember taking that energy of that, that idea and that whatever it was into session one day and we did a light session and I felt it leave. I felt, I felt that like that person or that child had been released to the light and whatever. And it was, it was a very nice feeling there. But um, I forget why I'm telling this story now. It's something you said. Prior to that, I would go there for coffee. Oh, man. Anyway, it's gone. It's done. Tina might remember. But there, there there's all these sort of a so things that goes on anyway. But I've lost that. It's like, whoop. <laughs> Tina, your turn. <laughs> your turn to put my finger on my nose. <laughs> Yeah, you have to, you have to like super glue, like a bit of glue, stick it. Oh, there. wait. Oh, okay. I thought you wanted me to remember what you were saying because I was like, I don't remember. Either. No. Okay. Oh, uh, you know, I, anything? Uh, Are you good? I'm sort of good. Um, I got a body attack though. I don't, when during Lori's thing, like, yeah, like all of these attacks in my body, like while you were going through <laughs> your thing. Yeah, I, I'm still like, Feeling that that's kind of strange because I don't think I have stuff like that. I'm trying to, oh. um, but I'm feeling. Where the, where's the where's the attack you're feeling? In my side, like right in here, like oh, like cramping really bad. You feel it? You see it? I'm looking. I can't see nothing. No, I still feel oh. it. And it's gone. Nope. Anyway. anyway. <laughs> Looks clear to me. Yeah, I feel it. It's gone. When I say it's gone, I feel it. But anyway. <laughs> but yeah, while she was having her release. Right. I was feeling that. Um, well, but yeah, when you story, were, isn't it? what's that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we all have the exact same story in different different way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had to get up. Uh, yeah, that was really mm -hmm. powerful. Thank you. Right. Uh, but you were saying how you kind of can't find it anymore because you know it's been really intense for me <laughs> the last few weeks, and. Um, it's like I kind of can't really, I know like what has happened, like the story and the, what you've given me, but I can't really find that right now. Like I can't really Good. know. Stop trying to find it. No, I don't, I don't want to find it. Oh my God. No, I don't want to find it. Um, but it was when you said that to her, I was like, oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> Just right. like real, like notice like, oh, I don't really feel that. Um, and. like you want to check the holy spirit's work you know <laughs> um, um, i don't completely 
I don't completely trust anything, including myself or especially myself. So when the Holy Spirit makes a movement in my consciousness or makes a movement in my mind, I want to check and see if it's still there. Maybe he missed a bit. It's like that doubt, you know, that little that little moment of doubt. It's like I remember lots of things. I used to have this terrible dream. I can still remember the dream and the manifestation that it took in my waking life as well. And I, I ended up going to see Ted about it one day. I, I sat down and he just started laughing and we went through a few things. But I still remember looking for it in my consciousness, looking for, for those attack thoughts that I was holding against myself in reference to that dream so I could maintain some kind of belief in duality. But uh, well, you reminded me of it when you were talking to her. It reminded me, like, right? Oh, yeah, that's it was intense. Um, a couple of days ago, and a couple of days ago, um, I right. you, you sent me that that tattoo, and when you sent me right. that tattoo, I was in a place, and I was um, in the park, like just having finished doing you know yoga. And then on a bit on a meeting at my job, and there was like this really strong like contrast. And I reached out to you because it was like this is this, something in this. It just doesn't. Feel, it feels like there's this real strong split. And you said that I needed to be specific with my prayer because I was like, what is this? Like I see this freedom in this tattoo. I feel this freedom in this space, and I feel this like we're talking about. It's the sales training. We're talking about like our warrior names and competing oh, against each other. And I was like, oh, this something is, this doesn't feel like, is this me? And when, when you said, you just said you need to be specific. And I felt myself defend myself. And I was like, don't defend yourself. But I was like, I don't, I have to. And so I did. I was like, well, I always pray, you know, for the healing oh. of my mind. Oh. And I knew that that was a defense, but I just, my mind split so I did I defended myself um but that day after you sent me the, um, the next thing about the Matthew <laughs> the tax collector <laughs> about the faith that day I felt like my, I was praying like my life depended on it like um that, that the prayer is for the healing of this mind that believes in separation and what I'm seeing is kind of like the results of that. And I won't know that anything has occurred until I see something. So I need a miracle. I need it to be miraculous in a way that I can understand. So that day, the oh, prayer was so strong. And um, a friend of mine reached out to me and she was going through something. And I was like, well, the only thing for me to do right now, I feel like there's all these other things that need to be done, but it's to join with my brother. Like this is what I'm asked to do is to join with my yep. brother. So I did. She was reflecting back to me so much. Um, and I knew it was my mind reflecting back to me this world, this world. I need the I need the world to be better. And I'm like, no, I'm praying for the healing of my mind. She's like, this, I need kind of like the reversal of cause and effect. Like, no, once my oh. world is better, then I will feel better. And I was like, no, I want the peace of God. I want the peace of God and the healing of my mind. I don't want to be distracted by this world. So I felt like this really strong distraction was like coming for me. And I knew I was only meeting my mind. This was only my doubt oh. thoughts that I was meeting. So and when I met with her, I was like, I would love to make you feel better, but I cannot risk what's going on right now. And, you know, I have to join with you, like, with this declaration that there's only this. This is all I want. I don't want anything else. So I can't, I can't play with you right now. Like, I can't. So if we're going to meet, what? it has to be like this. So that day just felt like a really yeah. strong, like. That's good you did that. Yeah. And I remember you told me that story too once before because there's, I have these opportunities. Um, people want to tell me things. And I, you told me that same story about is it Adele. So I've been really using now when people like want to speak to me about something and I've just been just listening to them, listening to them, listening to Good. them and knowing that I'm, this is just my, oh, and even today, but I want to finish this, this thought first that I'm just listening to it, listening to it, listening to it. And before I offer anything up, it's like, do you want another way to look at this? Or do you wanna, you know, is there anything that you wanna do other than talk about it? 
you know, and then offering just that. But anyway, it doesn't even really matter anything that I say because it's really just, I'm healing my mind. And today someone reached out to me, it was so beautiful to tell me about someone else that has cancer. And she says, Tina, do you have anything to say to that? And I said, the only thing I can say right now is that this is about my mind. You told me, like, first of all, if you're gonna tell her anything, it's like, there's nothing for us to say to her. Like, there's being so, uh, 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 something presented right now, like a separation being presented right now. So there's only the healing of our mind. And now you brought it to me. So now I've got to heal my mind and that's all that there's to do. Anything that comes, so that's all that there's to do is just to heal our mind. If anything comes out of that, that's what comes out of it. But I have to heal my mind. So you gave it to me. So now that's all I can do is just pray for the healing of this mind that believes that there's a spot where God is not, you know, where cancer can be something other than the goodness of God. So anyway, that's just how yeah. I've been feeling is like that really strong. And so it didn't even occur to me until you were talking to Lori, you know, <laughs> that, the, that there was a spot, you know, that there was anything going on. It feels like there's lots of, lots of, just, I'm going to my family's in a couple of weeks. So lots of things are being kind of wanting to distract me away from that one single prayer that you said, like, it's just, that's the only right. thing. But there's all these things that seem to be like, you need to take care of this right now. And it's like, no. I need to pray for the healing of this mind that believes that there's all of these dramas. So yeah. So yeah. So grateful. I'm so really grateful. Good. I'm grateful, Lori. Like, yeah, I'm just grateful. And Doug. And yeah, it didn't occur to me until. <laughs> and now my body's like trying to. Your body. Right. Your body. Pay attention to this. So. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I'm feeling. <laughs> yeah, thank you, brother. It's always perfect, isn't it? It's always perfect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You start to see that the grace of God exists, even in the slightest little doubt. There it is. It's like it's never leaves me. Goes with me. What is it? The grace of God. There by the grace of God go I. I'm going to have to read the book, see if I can brush up on my references. But... <laughs> you may, you're helping me. <laughs> right. But, but right. No, that goodness, what you're talking about, it, it just really does. It feels like. Yeah. I was telling my friend, it just feels like the, the wrong mind just kind of overplays his hand because it's so like obvious. Like you just, you just did too much. You know what I mean? Like the goodness of God is just like right here. And it's like, it's exposed, like, ah, but yeah, it feels so, so sweet. <laughs> you got to value the goal. Yeah. If you don't value the goal to the depth of integrity that you're capable of, to that full depth of integrity, you'll get caught up in out there. You'll forget to accept atonement for myself. You know, I'll forget, like, hang on a minute. I have to really, really, and sometimes you see it in retrospect. You know? It doesn't matter. I mean, you'll see it, but it's always better. Like you caught it in that moment. It's always better, I find, if you catch it in the moment because your integrity with how you're feeling is, uh, you, can't you can't doubt it. You can't deny it. It's like, no, I either feel upset or I feel joyous or I feel whatever it is. It's like anything that distracts you out of that sense of perfect inner peace. Yeah. If you're feeling joyous, you can be absolutely certain it's always at the expense of something else. Mm. You know? If you're feeling doubtful and fearful, it's always going to be at the expense of something else. Mm. something else is always going to be just as illusory as uh, any any other thing but you know you got to use what you got you got to use what you're given you got one story <laughs> let's transform it i'm the author this is my story it's been playing around and around for so long it's like it took me so long to write that story i don't want to go back and do the editing it's like it's a perfect story of suffering. It's like I mean, it's always a really good reason to go, but 
You know what I mean? Yeah. But mine goes, there's always a but, but it's like it's when like, you kind of, like you said, I like, you got nowhere to go. Here. Yeah, like you right. can't, like it's kind of once it's exposed and you know, like, it's just, this sounds like yeah. a really good spot where I can say in this, in this instance, but like I can't, I can't, you know? No. Yeah. Until I did. <laughs> Until I did. <laughs> By the grace of God. Mm. At some mm. point, you have to include God back into the equation. Thank you, Father. <laughs> Thank you, Father. <laughs> yes. I can take credit for nothing. Nothing. God is the doer. I'm mm. just the best, just the dumb klutz that gets used to sweep up the mess. So grateful. <laughs> And I'm so grateful. <laughs> so grateful. <laughs> so don't adjust. Don't adjust to your pain, Laurie. Right? I'm giving you that as something I need to learn also. All right? It's a constant. In this world, you have to always be vigilant. Right? There's never a time. It doesn't matter whether you reach enlightenment or don't reach enlightenment. In this lifetime, it's, it's important, but it's not the most the most important thing is your mind training to get your head straight around things it's like don't adjust to your pain let yourself feel it if you're telling a story you know absolutely for sure that it's because there's pain attached to it pain can take any form it can take joy as a form you know it can take you being happy as long as that happy or that sad is externalized my body my friends my situation my whatever so the only joy that I want is the, is the joy that comes from the grace of God in me as a recognized active thing. I walk with God in my heart and in my mind. All other reasons, forget it. It's kind of like a better, a better proposition to be joyous. It, like people who give to charity and do good works and deeds, that's fine. That kind of makes you feel good. But if it makes you feel good as offsetting yourself for feeling bad about not doing it or, or, you know, then it's false premises. You know, it's like that should be done. Things like that to help your brother and be the good Samaritan should come automatically without even thinking about it. You know, it's like that should be the nature of the mind to be in service, to see everything as an action of worship, as an action of the give of the grace of God that is within you. You know, and if you don't give it away, you'll lose it. You got to, you got to, it's not that you can ever really lose it, but you'll lose sight of it within yourself. You know, you've got to keep giving it away, giving it away. Just keep saying, yes, 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 yes. Wow. And thank you. Yes, here I am. Yes. You know? Even if you think that that yes is going to entail something that you possibly have no idea how you're going to fulfill your obligation to the yes, let it be miraculous. You know? Everything's going to be a leap of faith. Everything's going to have to be something that's, um, seen rightly is always calling you forward, calling you back into the light. Take another step, Laurie. Take another step, Laurie. Here, Laurie, here's this situation. You've confronted that one. You've done some healing there. Now let's look at this one. So it's like if you imagine a, a pie chart of all your relationships and interests and everything in the world, your footprint, right? And it has all these separated parts. It's like in the part that involves you as a little girl being told whatever, whatever, that part's been addressed, okay? That part's been addressed. It's been looked at in the light of healing and it'll do whatever it needs to do now, right? You don't have to be concerned about that part, but you can rest for a minute and then go on to the next slice and the next slice. So all of those relationships and all of those things all begin to line up to point to the center of the pie rather than being separate pieces that seem to be a bit for me and a bit for you. They're all one. They're all me. They're all my, uh, all my pie. I don't know if that makes sense. But... <laughs> all, all your relationships and things start to line up, you know, and we call that healing. It's like prior, prior to, um, prior to the idea of forgiving myself for what never happened, um, confronting that paradox, Everything was just whatever it would be. This bit of pie, you know, like pizza pie, you know, this one has too many olives. I don't like olives and you externalize it. And this one has anchovy. Yuck, I don't like anchovy. And I'll project that out there. I like the one that's just cheese and pepperoni. That's my favorite. I'll have all those bits. And then, you know, as if you could somehow separate it out. 
all those pieces together make what the pizza pie is. As soon as you start to decide how it ought to look, that's no longer pizza pie, it's something else. It's a piece of pizza pie. You know? It's like you got to allow the olives and the anchovies and everything else. It's like, okay, I'll put on my big boy pants and I'll eat the olives. I'll stop externalizing blame for the olives on that person or that situation. Those people are just playing a part for me. You know? And you get to see that, um, you know, there's gratitude. Thank you, God, for these people that have played that part for me. In the journey of my soul, there is a valuable catalyst, a valuable lesson that's been presented through that story. It's not until you're willing to forgive yourself for the story that you're going to understand what the catalyst is. Because otherwise you're looking at it from the wrong side. You're looking at it from the separative side. So forgive it first and then you'll see what it was hiding. It's like the idea of uh, I'll see it when I believe it. It's like, no, 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 no. You have to believe it first and then you'll see it. You can't have a miracle whilst there's still doubt in your mind. The miracle is asked through the perfect prayer, through the doubtless prayer, the prayer of the heart. I need a miracle because I believe in miracles. <laughs> if you're asking for a miracle with doubt, from that point of view, then no miracle can be given you because the miracle can't fit in where you still hold doubt more valuable than the miracle itself. So I've got to leave that space empty. I'm saying I want a miracle, but I've got the space where I want the miracle to fix everything in my life. And I've got all these doubts about it in there. How the hell is that going to be helpful? I need to forgive myself all those doubts. So that you know, or be willing to, so that the miracle can come and take the place of those doubts. I have to ask from a place of belief. The action of faith, all of these things that happen, even this Zoom meeting is an action of faith. I'm going to go to the Zoom meeting today because I don't know, but I need something to happen. I feel drawn to it or I don't feel drawn to it. Whatever, it doesn't really matter. Everything is an act of faith. In that act of faith, your belief becomes stronger. Your conviction in what it is you're about becomes stronger. So when you pray and when you start talking to God and that, you're praying from that stronger position, from that more conviction. You're not praying so much from doubt anymore. It's like the miracle. What's that game where the, the pieces come down and you fit them in? You got a... Jenga? Jenga? No, Jenga is where you pull the blocks out. <laughs> you know, when the little square on the computer screen, the blocks fall down and they they got to fit in down the bottom into the zigzaggy thing, and you you got like five seconds to manipulate it and it, and it slots in, and then the next one, if you don't get it in time, the whole game's over. No idea. Come on, Doug, you know what that is? I've never heard of it. It used to be like one of the free games you'd get on those old phones. I never played them. Oh, there was like snake and anyway, there was something else. But it's like that. The miracle fits in to a certain thing in your mind, right? To a certain vessel, a certain thing. It's like when Jesus says miracles are your right, but purification is necessary first, right? The purification is of your doubt, of your fear, right? The true miracle is the love that inspires that shift, So like, I want to see my brother as perfect. I want to see the world as through the eyes of Christ, not through my eyes. Because I want love to be unconditional. I want that to inspire everything in me. I'm tired of demanding things on my own terms because I see that it only gets my own terms. and uh, That's not fulfilling because I don't know what the meaning of life is. I'm just new terms every time I feel unfulfilled. It's like rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. Maybe if I had that deck chair up there, I'd have a better view. If I could just get those people to move, 
Maybe I'll go and ring the lunch bell. They'll all go in and I can have that chip. Like these devious little plans, you know. <laughs> we make plans for disaster. Stop trying to make a better deck chair on the Titanic and just get to the freaking lifeboats. It's all going down. It doesn't matter what deck chair you have. Get it? <laughs> just stay in salvation where salvation is offered to you. Stay in the vibratory frequency of where it's at for you in your own association with yourself. Listen to your spirit. Listen to that internal, that small, still voice. Listen to that quiet voice. If it tells you to come to a Zoom meeting, do it. If it doesn't tell you to come to Zoom, then it asks, where should I go? What should I do? Should I go to a Zoom meeting today? Should I do something else? Whatever. It doesn't matter what you do. I'm not sitting here hoping 50 people turn up. I'm sitting here one day hoping that nobody turns up. <laughs> My job is done. I can go. Thank you, Father. I'm only here to represent something that's totally obvious and free for the asking. It sounds ridiculous. I would even need to sit here to represent it, but I need to do that for myself, for my own healing, for my own expulsion of doubt and fear and all of these things. I'm, I'm constantly in the teaching of what I need to learn and hopefully, hopefully in the hearing of that, so many of these Zoom meetings have been incredibly helpful to me. Sometimes I wake up at like two in the morning and go, ah, oh, and I just have this moment. It's like something that occurred in the Zoom meeting that perhaps I missed in the moment of it, but it's like, it'll wake me up. I'll be like, bam, like, woo, that was a good one. You know, like you sort of catch it, you know, it's like, that's what I was looking at. It's like, damn, damn, I took my finger off my nose for a second and I missed. But then you, you, you kind of hear it, you know. So last night, so this is really cool. Last night, I got shown a few things. Tina, I got shown this whole, I think it was last night. Well, last night was the light, definitely. So last night, when I was going to bed, usually I'll have some kind of light experience, like there'll be some kind of flash of light or whatever in my consciousness. It happens all the time. When it first started happening, it was like, wow, what was that? How do I get more of that? Now it's just so often that it's just like... <laughs> You know, like, and this whole thing goes on. I don't even think about it anymore. It's like a kid with some, a tick, you know, you're like, uh, uh, you just kind of get used to it. It's just there. It's part of your thing. But usually, I don't know how to talk about this. So usually, have you ever been swimming in the ocean and a big wave picks you up and it just like dumps you into the bottom? It's like, oh, uh, and everything's kind of like rough and harsh and there's this jolt and it's like, oh my God, that was a dumper, you know, whatever. So usually that's how the light affects me, right, in my, in my thing. Usually when the light explodes through my consciousness, the reaction through my physical cells is like putting my finger in a PowerPoint. It's like, bang, and it's like, ow, that's really rough, you know. Last night when I'm laying down, and it's usually just a quick flash, last night I'm laying down and I forget the process I was doing in my mind. I always bring whatever I'm thinking back to a singular point. Right. So in my thinking, I'm, I'm thinking about something, reviewing my day mentally or whatever, looking for any sort of loose ends, you know, sweeping the pyramid. And um, sometimes I'll find stuff and I have to bring it back to God. It's like, all right, here's something, you know, and I'll, I'll sit and look at it thinking this is just an illusion. Only God exists. And I'll hold the two things in my mind. Right. So one will be what I think has happened or what I think is going on. And the other one will be the fact that this is just a dream. And one of those things cancels out the other. Okay. Because two thoughts that are diametrically opposed can't exist in the same thought frame in my mind at one time. Right. So they come together. I bring cause and effect together and boom, my mind opens and the light happens. So last night, whatever it was I was looking at, um, was dispelled in my mind. But when the light happened, instead of being dumped by this big wave, it was like a gentle swell like this. It was so beautiful. It was like this soft, gentle swell of light that just opened for a, it was like a portal opening in my mind just gently and then closing again. The light came out and closed again. There was hardly any reaction through my physical cells. There was like this kind of like 
just recognition, just this kind of like gentle feeling of, oh, the light, and then gone again, you know? So, but it was really profound. It was really big. And that if you, if you think of it as like a portal opening, it opened way up, you know, like way up. It wasn't just like, bam, like it usually is. And the light comes through like with urgency. It was just like a relaxed. So it was really, really, really nice. And in that, what was given to me, <sighs> I just got Ted just then. <laughs> oh, I, want, I want to tell you the backstory, but it's going to take me a while. I'll just, I'll just finish this bit. <sighs> so Tina you've been noticed you've been noticed you've been like it's almost like someone's assigned to your case on a permanent basis There's, I don't know how to describe it so like Ted used to talk about I've had an experience once of being out of my body in this place like an auditorium where there are just spirits around, all around. And at the time, Ted was incarnated on earth, right? My teacher. And I had no body. And what this is the backstory. I had no body. I won't tell you how that experience came about because that's a bit of a story, but I know I've told it before. But I had no body. And one of the spirits, one of the entities, I'll, I'll call it an entity for a second, that also had no body that was just pure spirit came down to me and showed me around this kind of like circular amphitheater or whatever, whatever. I can't even describe it. And there was a gap up in the ranks, in the seats. I caught there were no seats, but there was a gap between all these beings. And the voice in my head, which was this one with me, said, that's where your teacher Ted sits, right? There was a recognition that I'd made a note of the gap. And I knew in that moment, that my teacher Ted was a part of this divine circle of beings who were overseeing um, perhaps not just my atonement, but the atonement of my whole association, 144,000, whatever. I don't, I don't really have a way to express because I don't really understand it myself. <laughs> just a, I have a loose grasp of it. It's very hard to grasp. But anyway, so in the time since then, certain things have happened, usually in relation to students and people that I've taken on as well always students that I've taken on as um a saying yes right so when you ask me can we do zoom meetings and whatever and I said yes it's like I instantly recognize that there's a relationship between you and I specifically that the universe was asking to be um brought together for this reason and then whatever came out of that came out of that which is this and what happened last night was um, the result or the effects or, the, or the, the, the boom or the benefit of doing this has got to such a point that in you something has changed and they're aware of what that is. Right? Like Ted just, Ted just came to me just... <laughs> I can hear him in my mind. Like, it, you know, sometimes when you, you'll be thinking about stuff and you'll hear my voice in your head talking to you. I hear Ted in my head, right? So Ted, and for a long time he was gone because I, I had this, it wasn't a reluctance, but I knew that I had to hear my own voice, not him. I knew I had to stand on my own two feet. But now he comes back as like a friend, you know, and even though he's left, he's been assigned to your case. <laughs> he's been assigned to your case all right so you now have a friend in a very high place that's what i want to kind of tell you it's like there's more going on for you out of time right now than you're aware of with what you seem to find yourself participating in here Okay, so 
Remember in um, when Bill and Helen in the in the Ur text and uh, ooh, big bird just flew into my window and um, Jesus tells Helen, "You've been weighed in the balance and found wanting, right?" Which means that her association with the material is still not strong enough for her to be able to make good use of the material itself, right? It's it's still kind of this peripheral thing. So in your thing, you've been weighed in the balance by the tech crew or the cat. I call them the council because it's kind of a more, to me, it's a more reverent sort of reference, but I don't know the rest not giving me the results of your weighing, but I'm guessing it was good. <laughs> Ted's been assigned to your case. So. And you can actually experience that for yourself. Right? You can ask to know the truth of that, to, to know the guidance of those elders or those, okay? And you probably should. Right? But that's going to take some prayer as well. That's going to take some, you know. The idea, of, the idea of allowing your consciousness or your mind to expand out beyond the temporal framework is something that I would always encourage you to try and do, not through drugs or hallucinogenic, nothing like that, but through prayer and meditation, through, like, let it happen. You're in a guided thing now. There's this whole thing, like all of us are, there's this whole thing going on called the resurrection, and no matter how loosely we're involved in it, the very act of being involved in it is going to continue to draw us closer and closer to the center where we'll get into this kind of frequency of association with it, where we get beyond the point where we're even wondering whether it's too late to turn back or anything like that. There's like this point where our commitment with it has been accepted by us. It's like, I've got nowhere else to go. This is, this is a done, right? Exactly. Right. This is a done deal. Once that commitment is made, it's like, like Jesus says to Helen, make the commitment first. Once that commitment has been made and all the flip-flopping about is kind of out of the way, then we can start to make good progress, start to do, you know, because you're no longer looking for a back door or an escape or a way out of it or, or some, maybe I can participate on a lesser level or whatever or not so intense. All of that doesn't make any sense to do that anymore, right? It's just like, fuck's sake, let's just get this over with. I want it done. I know it's not going to be nice. Why drag it out? It's a journey into fear. What am I going to, what's going to be It ain't nice of... now. <laughs> right. Good. But it's nice to know. It's nice to have these little things that come along the way. So it's like last night, it's like when that dropped in, when that recognition or that awareness dropped into my mind it's like oh i have to tell tina you know but i had to ask first if it was okay to tell you that because i didn't know if the information was just for me at that point you know? in my mind there's always this higher collaboration that goes on especially at night when i close my eyes and the light just erupts through my consciousness that light is actually living information it's not just light so I can go, oh, look, the light, the light, the light. There's actually, that's that's communication from the divine. That light is a constant stream of living information that in this world assists me and you guys in what it is we're about here now. How that plays out, I don't really know. How that plays out and what you're going to do with that, I don't really know but I know that Ted's assigned to your case. So there is obviously going to be a greater thing going on for you than just you attending these Zoom meetings. Right? Because these Zoom meetings have to come to their natural final conclusion at some point. I don't know when that'll be, but everything is a temporary expedient. Everything here is um, only to bring you to a point of um, self-aligning if you like it's like it's my job to make myself redundant to you right? how that looks in the playing out of all these meetings and everything i have no clue about that but i know that at some point there's a 
there's like a, a going on from this. There's like a new chapter, a new sort of thing that, you know, for everybody. It's like I knew when um, I was done at the centre there and done with sitting with Ted for all those years that I'd sort of finished my um, discipleship in a sense and I was now to be about my apostleship. I was now to carry what I had learnt with me out into the world and begin the um, higgledy-piggledy job of trying to represent it. And it was very higgledy-piggledy at first. I, I fell into a heap many times, but I kept getting up, dusting myself off and, you know. But that's how that's just how this is. It's like you, you, you teach what you need to learn and sometimes, man, you just... You realise how false you are in this and you realise how full of shit you are in this and you just got to keep teaching anyway. You just got to keep going forward, keep trying to take that next step because it makes no sense to sit on your thumbs and it makes no sense to try and go back. You know, it's like it's like a baby learning to walk. Oh, I keep falling down. I'll just sit here. Fuck it. It's like, no, nah, you got to get up and you just got to keep taking another step and another step and another step. Just keep going. What's that fish? Just keep swimming. Just keep swimming. I saw a boat. What's that? that? Uh, Dora, Dory, uh, Dory. Ne Dory Nemo Dory. and Dora. Dory, yeah. Dory's like my saviour. Just keep swimming. Just mm. keep swimming. I was so scared of Ted. She has no I'm clue like where it. she's swimming to. She doesn't care. She just keeps swimming. Eventually, she'll get to somewhere. <laughs> All right, well, I'm done. You guys done? You all good? Yeah. I have a question. Laurie, Laurie what, there's a thing. Yeah, go on. Oh, what time do you meet tomorrow night, and what other times do you meet? I was going to... Yeah, I yeah. was going to reach out to you so stay stick around at the end okay because i know you're not okay. in the chat so i want to just just chat with you real quick so, okay. so don't she's not in the chat no i'm going to talk to her about that right now oh put her put her in there then maybe so. yeah if she i don't know if, we, if we're going to talk about it and see like why not so. but it's six o'clock my time yeah or seven o'clock my time uh i think it's what seven it? what are you talking about tomorrow sunday uh, sunday yes yeah, so seven six. uh i don't know seven. i don't know what time is your time it's uh well you always you're always fine tomorrow it's um 1 p.m for the okay. first 20 minutes and brother pops in do the, do the 20 minutes 1 p.m and then 2 p.m is uh but he he pops on early so you you yeah do the, do the, almost always on, on sunday okay. all right but um I know you're anyway let's let's chat for a minute because maybe we can get you in the sure. chat which would be really because okay. there's another yeah. meeting too that you could come to during the week okay. which you probably don't know about all right thank you so much I feel like there's something else laurie hang just hang on for a second yes <laughs> not so good it's all good. I'm just looking thing. Everything's quite a, kind of clear there. So. All right, good. See you all tomorrow. Peace. Thank you. All thanks be to God. Thank you, Father. You. <laughs> watch out for um, watch out for nubile maidens knocking on your door, Doug. Just remember, say yes. <laughs> nubile. <laughs> that the word nubile. Is that me? <laughs> Is that is that what that means? I thought isn't it, it meant. Isn't like, it? I isn't thought it? It, I thought new ball was um like. I don't live. know why I'm having some association with with. I don't know. Maybe I'm just wrong. You're probably thinking Nubian. I am. Oh, no, <laughs> Star Wars Nubian. Is there is there a Nubia in Africa? Is is Nubia a country in Africa? Nubian queens. I don't know. All I know is Nubian queens. Namibia. So Namibia is. I oh, know Namibia. No Namibia. New ball. I'm gonna Google, Google it. I'm going to Google that. Anyway, you can be our Nubian queen, um, Tina. That's. I'll do that. I think Nubian.
a reference from Star Wars, though. But anyway, either way. Well, let's <laughs> check handy Google. <laughs> right, you can check that. Y'all my learning. All right, peace and love. Love you. Thank you. Love, love you. Love you and love you. Love you. Thank you. Uh, oh, Doug is gone. <laughs> gone. Wow. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop the recording so we can just okay. chat for a second.